like mm-hmm. it's it's just bizarre to live like this for two years not just me but the entire nation right um trying desperately to have a normal life because that's what we do that's how we're programmed as humans everything should be normal and we should go about our daily business but then all of a sudden boom 30 people die three kilometers from my apartment on the 29th of december and i saw the explosion like whoa crazy shit but then what do i do i went down to a cafe and worked you know like mm-hmm. yeah really but that's so the Okay, yes, yeah, so now we're ready to roll. Well, so one more time, thanks a lot for doing that. I've always been interested in foreigners who currently reside in Ukraine because, you know, it's one thing to know the Ukrainian people take on current situation, which is uh, predominantly understandable, right? But you being a foreigner, what country do you come from, by the way? Okay, you are unprepared. Oh, yeah, yeah, man, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Yeah, I'm um, from Denmark. Danish. From Denmark. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So, how how has life connected you with Ukraine, if you don't mind speaking, and if that's not a vulgarly obvious topic for you? Um, April 2022, I was deeply, deeply affected by the illegal invasion of Ukraine. Following it every day, way more affected by it than I thought I would have been. I grew up during the Cold War. This is what they warned us about, and then it's happening, you know? So uh, that was wild, man. Um, but then I get an email one day. Um, you know, I'm standing there going, what the fuck? You know, yeah. Ukraine's invaded. What do I do? I can send some money to the Red Cross or something, right? But then I get an email in my inbox um, from two urban planners here in uh, Ukraine, one mm-hmm. in Lviv and one in Kiev, and um, they had a problem. They had 200,000 people in uh arriving in Lviv almost overnight, you know, the mobility was paralyzed. Um, people couldn't get around. Um, and stay safe. let's ask that famous Danish guy, the guy who yeah. this urban designer, he's in Denmark. They have lots of bikes. Right. You know, he wrote a book about bikes right. and how to right. design cities for bikes. And then, um, so this email, I remember, man, I remember so clearly in the morning, sitting down at home at my table there to work. And uh, there's an email from these people saying, hey, can you help us with this? Can you get bikes, used bikes, and figure out how to get them wow. to Ukraine? Yeah. And I just, I can tell man, it was emotional because all of a sudden there was something that I could do. Right. You know, something in my wheelhouse, something yeah, that... Yeah, uh, practical. Yeah, I had I had skills for this. This was like literally my job. And no, I don't get bikes before, but I mean, um, I went, oh my God, yes. This is a personal appeal from colleagues in invaded ukraine mm-hmm. i'm on it i answered them like two minutes later and you know, mm-hmm. now i know them and stuff but they're like holy shit he answered man wow and i'm going of course so then i started to get bikes figured out how to ship them to ukraine and then that all started and then uh, then i ended up here and then mm-hmm. doing eight million other things now but that's how i started interesting yeah that's fascinating so think this think about bicycles you had been involved into repairing sort of used bikes right and giving them away to people who need them could you tell me a bit more about that how, how that began yeah i so i the shared the fascination with bikes uh, as well as you probably perhaps you you share it on a considerably yeah. higher level yeah I don't I don't care about bikes. I just believe in bikes as the future of mobility and the past oh, yeah. of mobility. I'm not a bike geek. I don't have any uh, yeah. helmet and all the goofy gear. I just ride bikes in <laughs> Copenhagen because everybody does, man, uh, because we have infrastructure. But I, I have written the Bible about how to design cities for bikes, and I've designed wow. infrastructure for cities around the world So um, for years. But um, so, yeah, the first appeal was we're paralyzed with mobility in the view. Yeah. Bikes will help the the IDPs, the internally displaced people, get around, um, lighten the load on public transport and cars. Um, But then quickly after that, once they started bringing bikes here, there was a whole different uh, category that opened up. So the poetry is that bicycles arrive registered as humanitarian aid um, Mm -hmm. when when they come to Ukraine. But then Mm -hmm. I give them to my network of NGOs all over this country who use them or they give them to social workers and volunteers. So the bikes are used to deliver humanitarian aid. And that's where most of the bikes are right now. Um, delivering food, water, medicine, humanitarian aid to the most vulnerable citizens in the deoccupied area. So one simple used bike that nobody wants to see anymore in Europe is now riding with like 12,000 yeah. wow. kilograms a year, wow. helping yeah. 5,000 people, right? So, Game and I need 9,000. Right. 
Yeah, I, I need thousands more, but, but nobody cares about Ukraine anymore. So there's no crowdfunding. It's getting a bit tough, right? But that's what those bikes do. And initially, those bikes had been gathered from, I imagine, multiple European cities, right? And they had been somehow broken. People gave them up. Yeah, um, there's a mix um, in Copenhagen. Uh, well, first of all, in Denmark, we throw away 400,000 bikes a year mm. and we buy half a million every year. Like, so we have a lot of leftover bikes. So th- those bikes I get from the, the Danish police, they give me the abandoned bikes. Some of them are just need minor repairs. Um, but I've also done like bike collections in Berlin, in Ghent, in Budapest, uh, where people come with their bike, they fix it up and they give it to us and we put it on a truck. So they're ready to roll. So these are like the personal donations. That makes it much more nicer when it's actually a, somebody who takes the bike down and gives it to you and loads it on the truck, right? So it's a mix kind of, of more two. conscious. Bikes and, yeah. Right? Sorry? A bit more consciously, right? Con- conscious approach towards wh- where your bike really goes, you know, and people must pay attention, I imagine. Oh, sure. Like, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm, I could get all poetic about bikes, you know, like if somebody used it. It was a utility, you know, they, they it mm-hmm. helped them get around their city and then maybe mm-hmm. they have a new bike and they have a leftover and that bike, you know, will now help somebody else and it will have new momentum, you know, mm-hmm. uh, instead of just going to recycling. So, you know, bicycles are incredibly resilient. I've written an article about how whenever there's a disaster, a war, um, you know, anything going wrong for the past hundred years, bicycles are the most valuable thing you can hmm. have, right? Like, because um, if it's almost know. stupid application, you know, practicality, right? Like stupid positively, right? It does need a lot of yeah. maintenance, right? Exactly. And, you know, I have photos, you know, historical photos, like from after Hiroshima, and there's a guy with a bike loaded with stuff on the bike. So you can carry more things on a bike. You can get away faster. It's literally, I have lots of, seen lots of news photos of a bombed building in Ukraine. And then there's somebody coming out of the cellar because they went down there and said, what, I, what valuables can I take from this bomb building? And oh my God, there's a bike, you know, that, that will help me in 8 million different ways. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, well, it's the best, one of the best inventions by humankind. I've always said it to people. It's the only vehicle, as far as I'm concerned, that makes the human better. Like a car driving a car might certainly give you a bit of a self esteem pump, you know, but it will not make your body physically fitter and healthier. You know, it's much better. Now, if you have a, if you have a small dick, then a car makes yeah. you feel like you have a bigger <laughs> dick. Yeah. But yeah. that's about that. <laughs> so Lviv was the first city you arrived to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. How do you evaluate Lviv from perspective of bicycle infrastructure? Like, is that a city for the bicycle or is, because people say driving a car is a bit of a challenge in that city. Yeah, no, it's not. A, there's no good cities in Ukraine for bikes yeah. um, at all. Yeah. Lviv is maybe a bit better. They're designing more infrastructure now. They're not yeah. designing it every time well based on best yeah. practice, um, but they're, they're making an effort. Um, but still, it is, uh, you know, it, it, every, any city can be the perfect city for bikes if you design for it, right? It doesn't matter where and when. Um, so Lviv is probably one of the better ones. I think there's more people cycling, like statistically, in Venezia. Uh, mm-hmm. How do you say that sound? In, in, in Venezia. Venezia. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, and everywhere I go around this country, I've been all over the place, out in the villages, people are still riding, you know, bikes, you know, Absolutely. farmers and stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Choice number one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Lviv uh, is not great. I mean, Lviv is a great city, but, uh, you know, a nice European yeah. city, but uh, not for bikes. No. Yeah. And from your professional perspective, what a city needs, I know it's a bit of a, um obscure and broad question. How would you integrate a bit more sort of bicycle friendly, you know, city infrastructure in, in context of Lviv, for instance? So apparently more bicycle lanes, perhaps some road rules, regulations, what would have to be done in your opinion? Infrastructure. That's all it takes. Uh, you have, we have best practice that we've figured out in Denmark starting in 1915. Um, it's tried and tested. You just copy paste it into any city in the world, man. Uh, so you separate bikes from motorized traffic and pedestrians. Everybody has their own hierarchy of space. Um, you prioritize bikes in intersections. You know, the bikes have a green light before the cars do in Copenhagen, things like that. Everything's been figured out, man. It's just copy paste. So, um, it's, and it's really to invent a bicycle, so to speak. Right. Exactly. Um, and what, what you also do is like, you know, you take away space from cars, which is what's happening all over Europe. You know, Paris is removing 65,000 car parking spots as we speak. Right. Um, you know, the mayor is saying, Oh, driving a car. That was so last century, literally the mayor of Paris says stuff like that. Um, so yeah, you take away, 
this, you know, they've been given all this space for so many years. It's like a transportation, uh, you know, mm -hmm. dictatorship, right? And uh, we need to make it more democratic. We need to right. have better bus lanes, better sidewalks, mm -hmm. better bike lanes, you know, and even the playing field now. The car, the motorist man, you know, they've they've been given everything, and now it's time for us to take it back, right? The public space that is the street, you know, we all should yeah. share it. Yeah. One thing that particularly drives me crazy is there's this car driver who clearly occupies too much of a sidewalk, you know, and parks his shitty car half half of the sidewalk, and those pedestrians have to pipe, bypass it, you know, and and manage and f freaking twist themselves around those cars. That's that's really annoying. That that really drives me crazy. How how was your art impacted by? coming to Ukraine by the war, by air defenses, uh, alerts and missiles and risks. My art, the artwork yeah. I've been doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that came out of nowhere. I mean, I've done art for many years, mm -hmm. but then I met this Ukrainian artist and we had fun and we said, let's make a dual exhibition. Um, and then we had to have a theme. So we're out drinking and she had been out of the country during the, since the invasion. So she came back home to be with her people here in Kiev, but she didn't know anybody in Kiev. And, um, and then we're out seeing classical music and then we're at a cocktail bar. And then she said, this is so fucked up. Like we're literally watching classical music concerts. We're dressed up nice. We're at a cocktail bar and missiles can fall. And I said, Oh, there's a word for that in English. It's called snafu. Second world war military, uh, ironic military, uh, word meaning situation normal all fucked up like mm -hmm. everything's normal it's fucked and that's normal and I, and we both went oh my god that's the theme so mm -hmm. based on that theme man I, we started creating and 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 i found myself before that even just mm -hmm. doodling like sketching human forms you know mm -hmm. while i'm super stressed in my apartment because the whole building's shaking because uh, missiles are being shot down all around me so i started using art as art therapy and that continued into the exhibition that i did um this snafu exhibition like um trying to live a normal life, you know, in a war zone. Like, it is bizarre. And every Ukrainian that I talk to at the exhibition, they go, oh, my God, yeah, avocado toast, you know, and then the missiles are falling. And, oh, but I have to go to yoga, you know. Uh, it's it's just bizarre to live like this for two years, not just me, but the entire nation, right, um, trying desperately to have a normal life because that's what we do. That's how we're programmed as humans. Everything should be normal, and we should go about our daily business. But... Then all of a sudden, boom, 30 people die three kilometers from my apartment on the 29th of December. And I saw the explosion like, whoa, crazy shit. But then what do I do? I went down to a cafe and worked, you know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, really. But that's so. The, and, and it, it takes I, a bit of uh, awareness, almost this random sort of spontaneous realization where you are in the middle of what situation you are, really. Do you think your art really thrives because of this? Um, ongoing feeling of threat. Have you learned how to benefit from it and use it as a source of inspiration and amuse? You think? Yeah. Yeah, we did this exhibition, and then this whole snafu theme. I, I'm not done with it, man. Um, I've got a whole sketchbook in front of me here with uh, paintings that I will do. I'll probably have another exhibition somewhere else in a couple months. But yeah, it's all this, you know. But then you get into the deeper sociological aspects of mm -hmm. it. So snafu is kind of funny, you know, oh, my God, eating avocado toast, you know, and going to yoga while the missiles mm -hmm. fall. But then, you know, then there's the whole sociology, you know, everything mm -hmm. here for two years has been Slava Ukraini, Rome Slava. But man, and that's important. Um, but that you know, the, the human toll, right? Um, my exhibition, so many people said at the opening, like, oh, my God, this is all the things that we think and feel, but we're not allowed to talk about because it's mm, considered, mm. you know, unpopular opinions, socially right, unacceptable right. to talk about your feelings when right. boys are dying on the front lines right. and we have to fight. Yeah. For oh, that's big. Yeah. That's amazingly yeah, big, yeah. you know. And the more you don't talk about it, the worse it's going to get. Right. So I don't know how to open up that conversation, but the exhibition. Well, through art. To right. Through art, yeah. yeah, and conversation about art, and then yeah. in, you know, in trying to enable people to talk about their yeah. feelings. It's like I have a lot of my paintings have a lot of text, and uh, it's things that Ukrainians have said to me because I'm a safe space. I'm a foreigner, mm. you know. Like mm. talking to one friend of mine, and she said, "We're talking about oh, how the world keeps talking about how resilient Ukrainians are, mm. which which they are." Um, but then she said, she just looked at me and she said, Michael, I am so tired of being so fucking resilient, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to wake up every morning and say, today, I have to be resilient. Like yesterday, oh, I just want to, like, not have to be resilient, just live a normal life, right? So that 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 mental struggle um, of trying to survive, trying to be normal, and then people you know are 
dying on the front lines, people you went to school with or whatever. Mm -hmm. I had a friend of mine die two days ago in Odessa. Yeah, right. and we're back. Yeah, I'm sorry that the, the this glitch happened when right when you were talking about what happened in Odessa recently. So you said that a friend of yours passed right due to that attack. Yeah, not a friend. Like I only met him once, but former deputy mayor of Odessa, and you know, I have photos of him, and I gave him a copy of my book. We had dinner. We talked about how to make Odessa better, um, and uh, and then you know he was just slaughtered in his home by a Iskander missile, right? Like, and Ukrainians have. I've been asking a lot of Ukrainians since then. I'm going, how many people do you know personally? Like somebody you went to school with, an acquaintance, whoever it is, who have died, you know, in in, in this war. Um, some people are like, oh, like three or four. This one girl today was like about fifty. 50 mm -hmm. people um, wow. from school and uh, and and also, you know, at, on the front lines, but also in missile strikes. I'm going, fuck, mm -hmm. man. I got one, right? But, I mean, that impacted me because mm -hmm. it's like the first person I know personally that I drank wine with and had dinner with. And then, you know, he's not even on the front lines. He's a guy older than me just in his home and getting slaughtered, right? So, yeah, it's kind of really impacted me. So that's going to probably mm -hmm. come into some artwork uh, mm -hmm. you know, soon. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the way to deal with it, man. You know, I got art. I got, you know, I can, I'm creative. I can do that, you know, but there's other ways other people can do it, you know, like, you know, garden therapy or, you know, there's lots of ways we can deal with it if we try to take our mind off of it and, and become productive in another way, right? So, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's beautiful yeah, that you've managed yeah. to, to, to find this sort of a gateway, you know, this really, uh, an exit from taboo topics. What do your, what, what, what do you make out of this supposition? I, I like repeating that phrase, although I don't know if I entirely agree with it. It must have been Winston Churchill who said that during, uh, during the fight for democracy, we do not embody democracy. Have you ever heard that phrase and what do you make out of it? Yeah, um, totally true. I mean, I don't, I mean, yeah, there's martial law here because there has to be during a war, right? But I mean, yeah, it's a tricky one. I saw another one, there's another quote, who was it? Um, I think one of the black power uh, who, uh, men in America in the 60s is saying, you know, we can't, you can't, you can't have peace, right? The peace is, uh, it's just everybody being complacent, right? Mm -hmm. He says, we're black in America. We need to fight. You know, we, mm -hmm. we need to, uh, continue. you know, we can't have peace because we're fighting for equal rights. As soon as everybody's equal, then we can have peace, but that's mm -hmm. never going to happen. So it's kind of the same thing, right? But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, this is a great quote. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know why, but the last couple of days I'm like, you know, the French have been talking about boots on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Macron mm -hmm. is saying, mm -hmm. yeah, we're going to send troops and we're not, you know, eliminating this option. And all of NATO is going, oh, no, don't do that. We're not doing that. Mm -hmm. And the French are going, yeah, you know what? Like, this we, this has got to be won and this war. You know, all of a sudden, uh, Macron grew a pair. You know, it took him a little bit of time, but all of a sudden, yeah, he's back in the game. <laughs> it's election year, though. It's election ah, year. Okay. So you never know about that either. He, nobody mm -hmm. knows who Macron really is, but whatever. Mm -hmm. With, with this is my friend, my colleague who died in Odessa two days ago. And then I'm all of a sudden in my country, Denmark, man, we're like one of the biggest supporters of, of Ukraine. We're small, but we're rich. And we're, you know, we're throwing a billion euros in, in mm -hmm. missiles, uh, sorry, in the military. You know, I'm super proud of that. But all of a sudden I'm just going, let's get some boots on the ground, man. You know, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. going to be a shit show. But I mean, mm -hmm. there's. We're not supporting. Do you Ukraine. think in your country there would be plenty of people who would be potentially ready, like military people, soldiers who would know the cause? Yeah, Denmark's yeah. very aware of Ukraine. The, the government continues yeah. to throw money at it. And I think, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's Danish people who came here to fight two years ago, right? Volunteers. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I don't think Denmark would send boots to, on the ground here unless mm -hmm. it was a NATO decision. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, but the French, you know, the whole thing they're doing, I'm kind of going, okay, yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. Let's maybe, let's really talk about that. And the French can do what they want. They don't need to have NATO. Um, mm -hmm. That would be a powerful signal to send, right? But, um, you know you what? Know. I also sometimes tend to think that when countries uh, demonstrate this particular readiness, willingness, it might not be out of support to Ukraine as much as out of hatred towards Russia. I have a Canadian friend of mine who says that NATO has always been training, keeping Russia in mind, keeping USSR in mind. So maybe that could play a bigger part. Yeah, it's yeah, about but the Russian threat. 
Sure. I mean, it is Russia. That's the threat. You know, Russia must be defeated and kicked out of Ukraine and dismantled in some way. Fine. That's a bigger job. But I mean, I mean, France, like they're saying, it's literally on the doorstep of Europe, you know, mm-hmm. where I, my home, I mean, well, Denmark is 400 kilometers from Russia. If you think mm-hmm. about Kaliningrad, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, they've been provoking and provoking for years when they send their jets into Danish airspace mm-hmm. and then out. You know what I mean? Like they're just, wow. it's all, they're still playing the Cold War game and the rest of us grew mm-hmm. up, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so like, it's more real, I think, for us in Europe. Because it's literally on our doorstep, right? Um, and if they if they if they win in Ukraine, yeah, what's next, right? You know, Moldova probably, probably all the countries are not in the EU first, you know, but they'll take Moldova in a in a in a, an afternoon. Um, wait a sec, please keep the app open until your recording is finished uploading. I haven't touched anything, but now my mm. photos, my oh wait, uh, weird. Yeah, the camera seems to be off one more time. All right, I'll rejoin. Hang on. Okay, sorry. Yeah. It's not your app. You didn't make it, did you? Is it your app? Nope, nope. <laughs> I don't think so. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, back. yeah, yeah. Uh, being a, a foreigner in Ukraine, are you sometimes faced with sort of misunderstanding from other foreigners, American people, perhaps particularly? Uh, do you face any of a bit of a backlash online as of to yeah. why you stay here and wh- why you sort of support Ukraine? Not sort of, you pretty much directly. Yeah, not much of a pushback. Ah. I kind of left Twitter ages ago, which mm-hmm. is lucky. Which I'm not is the best decision Twitter, probably of your life. Yeah, I know Elon Musk is a fucking moron. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't really go out there. I know that like when I started coming here, you know, like there was like pushback somewhere, uh, you know, just stupid comments, and it's just stupid comments from trolls. Yeah. So who cares, right? Like it's not it's not real. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't affect me. Mm-hmm. No, generally, no. I think a lot of my friends and colleagues around the world who know that I'm here. I mean, I, you know, like I'm literally here. And so arguing with somebody who's not here, who's mm-hmm. giving you shit for being here, I'm going, I'm here. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's an air raid right now. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah, fuck yeah. you, I'm here. Right, right, <laughs> I'm, right, I got yeah. my boots on the ground here doing the things yeah. I can do, right? So uh, you can't really argue with when I'm actually sitting here and they're not here, you know? So the right. conversation mm-hmm. is really boring for them. <laughs> yeah. So no, I, I have support from friends and colleagues. Absolutely. They're, That's you know, right. in, you know right. a year and a half now. So yeah. <laughs> You might have seen certain pushback from American people who claim that, uh, you know, America has somehow propelled this whole war or has almost initiated it. And what do you make out of it? I've always said that, you know, America's got, American nations got zero boots on the ground and for their economical machine, this, uh, what do you call it? Military, industrial military complex or something like that. If you've looked into it, it's a great deal for them. Um, what do you think about? potential American, you know, and I'm bombarding you with the sort of geopolitical questions that I'm not much aware of. And I don't think a lot of people generally, uh, but since once America cuts the support, what, how do you see the future of Ukraine potentially after the American election, if Trump becomes, goes in the office? Yeah. I mean, I don't really care what America yeah. does or thinks like it's a broken nation that has no influence on my daily life and hasn't had you know, for, for decades, apart from they have a big military and they bomb brown people all over the world. Fine. You know, but, um, I don't really care. Um, yeah, but if the, if Trump gets elected and then, you know, all support for Ukraine it dries up, that's a problem. You know, mm. Ukraine, like I said it the other day, man, you know, America, go, oh, we're the leaders of the free world. Yeah. Right. You know, the, the leaders of the free world right now, it's Ukraine, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The people fighting for their freedom, they're fighting for their own freedom, but they're they're literally protecting Europe mm-hmm. and they're protecting the United States. They're protecting everybody. So all the support that they've been given is, of course, we do that. Um, mm-hmm. Do we and continuing to give the support? Of course, we do that. Mm-hmm. You know, like little Denmark, man, we're scaling it up. I think the prime minister just said um, three weeks ago, we're sending the entire Danish artillery to Ukraine. Like it, we're shipping it now. Like, come on, mm-hmm. this kind of support is what we need. This is not Ukraine's war. This is. This is everybody's war. And so the leaders of the free world, man, they, that's, that's, 
the Ukraine, the Ukrainian military and the Ukrainian people, right? Yeah, well, the, the war experience that soldiers obtain, right? And and the pr prospers of us joining NATO, do you think that could be on the horizon? Do you think that's happening one somehow in down the future? I think uh, everybody, I don't think they can. Well, we know they can't just, yeah. well, I guess they technically could just say now Ukraine is a NATO yeah. member, but there's a lot of geopolitical stuff yeah. going on there but of course uh, ukraine which should be in nato you know yeah. um do you think that would be the only sort of a guarantee for ukraine that is necessarily um to obtain yeah no i think we can still support them militarily right i think yeah. uh you know there's all these um foreign uh, ammunition factories yeah. that are setting up here because yeah. ukrainians are running out of ammunition yeah there's business in it these arms dealers yeah. are going to make money that's kind of sucks right but um if you have to defend the f entire free world from russian mm -hmm. aggression it's you, know, you got to get more game face on like we had back in the beginning so you got to continue that so. so you're positive that even without the NATO membership there are still chances right for us to resist and push back yeah it's it's uh but like the american funding you know Uh, 60 billion oh uh, mm. man that's needed so bad so if that disappears right. and all future yeah. uh funding disappears you know europe europe can step up and uh you know europe some massive power right yeah. um so i don't know where the money i'm not an economist dude but yeah. um you know i'm right. sure the money can be found you know we found money to tackle covid i mean mm -hmm. if this mm -hmm. is important for our the freedom of uh, mm -hmm. our generation for uh, mm -hmm. 200 years to come It's it's time to it's time to step up to the plate, you know, and um, more money, boots on the ground, whatever it takes. Like it's, you know, Ukraine, uh, they're not losing the war now, but I mean, it's not going very well. They're running out of fucking ammunition, you know, like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And speaking and about social aspects of, of people, have you per perhaps as being a sort of this art re representation in Ukraine? And as you said, the silent voice of a lot of thoughts that Ukrainians have been suppressing. Have you perhaps noticed a bit of a social change towards war from civilians? You know, it's a bit of a sketchy topic, apparently. Right. But again, it's like I'm happy that you seem to really be the sort of a sp safe space because you see some certain that's that that comes That's a part of a package where war comes to your country. Certain things become really problematic to discuss, apparently. So have you been noticing a bit of a attitude switch in civilian people and people of art, perhaps? Uh, just people generally. I mean, I, yeah. you know, um, yeah, two things. So one, you know, back in 2022 and, and into 23, you know, mm -hmm. A lot of everybody switched to Ukrainian, right? Mm -hmm. The Ukrainian mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. became a symbol of resistance. Mm -hmm. I notice now that I hear a lot more Russian, um, and that and, and, and language is one of the roots in our brain, right? We are always more ourselves speaking our mother tongue, so I don't have a problem with that. But I've noticed that switch, so it's really hard to maybe just maintain, you know, oh, I have to speak Ukrainian everywhere. Um, if you grew up and you speak to your mama in Russian, right, and you're Ukrainian, right? Um, so I've noticed that switch. Um, the other thing is I was at a conference, I was on a panel discussion about urbanism last week and there's an introduction and all that. And then at the end of the introduction, the host said, Slava Ukraini. And everybody went, yeah, but we're all Slava, right? But uh -huh. I went, lack of enthusiasm, right? Not that you passionate know, anymore. Yeah, I, of course they're passionate about the country, but like, I just realized, wow, I have not heard Slava Ukraini or Rome Slava for a long time. Mm. Like where back in 2022, you'd say it at a bar, right? Like, yeah, you leave in the bar, Slava, could you, Slava, you know, but then now it's kind of like, ah, Harum Slava, yep. Okay, yeah, we're still in this, right? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, people I know are still dying and, you know, it's, it's hard on them, on, on any human to maintain, you know, Slava, Ukraini, Harum Slava, you know, when, uh, It's been two years of this shit, right? So right, right, right. Um, no criticism at all to anybody, but I just understand the sociology here. Yeah. That it's tough, yeah. man. So, so you relate to it, things right? like that. Yeah. yeah, and on the anniversary of the invasion, you know, I'm texting friends here in Kiev and I'm saying, hey, anything to see? Like, is there any kind of like gathering somewhere where people put flowers? I don't know. And everybody's going, I don't know. Didn't even look. No idea. Well, nobody was doing anything, you know? Um, Where in Europe, and you know, there's 10,000 people in Berlin, you know, protesting, you know, against Russia and support for Ukraine. But in Ukraine, everybody's going, yeah, no, I think I'm just going to go shopping today, maybe and go to a bar tonight and maybe talk to some friends. Like, there, you know, that that also is a sign that that yeah, war fatigue and, is something, yeah. you know. 
would you would you have a different in ideal case scenario otherwise to paraphrase my i don't know the question do you find this switch more of an understandable and acceptable sort of switch which is not uh only pertain in Ukraine? In other words, do you think perhaps if, God forbid, something of this kind happens in, in Denmark, do you think people would also get fatigued um, over some period of time? Because I've been thinking about that. And one thing I've been sort of conflicted about is that, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at myself, the level of readiness only when the war began and the level of actions compared to now has been. And, you know, it's again, it's a it's a one of those sensitive topics. So do you think it's just human thing or is it something particularly regarding Ukrainians from your perspective? <laughs> I think it's human, man. Um, I think generally, humans, right. yeah, humans, uh, we're all hardwired the same way. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think if you're, if you live in a region, um, you know, where your daily life is famine and war mm-hmm. and, you know, murder and like, you know, like in Africa or you know, Sudan or wherever they're fighting and it never gets better, you know, um, um, I think you probably get it into your head that this is in for the long term. And you kind of accept that, you know, what, I'm, I'm so sad, but you know, you're probably going, yeah, you know, people will die today, whatever, but I just need food for my kids. You know, you're kind of, you're in the struggle here, you know, it's a pretty modern nation, right? Where they're in after the first invasion at 14, you know, the digital transformation, you know, amazing pivot, you know, wonderful. Um, <clears throat> so many uh, IT people here work with, with companies abroad. We all know it's a hardworking workforce and, uh, lots of export and, you know, but so it's kind of like a, it's just a big European country, like, you know, like another Poland in a way, right? Just with a lot, you know, a lot to offer. So I think the people here are just trying to live a daily life. And, um, and then this came along out of nowhere, right? It's not something that huh, it has been going on for 40 years, right? It's all of a sudden, and then it lasts two years and maybe more years. And yeah, so I think, um, yeah. Was that an answer? I guess it was. I, I guess, think it's, yeah, it is yeah, a different sure. context. It is a different yeah, context, yeah, right? right. Um, than, and, than, than other more impoverished parts of the world. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Um, I think we're still all, humans will always find a way to, to, to survive. That's how we're mm-hmm. hardwired, right? And, and to um, adopt. And here it's kind of like, is this done yet? Like, why isn't mm-hmm. it done yet? I heard it was going to be amazing counteroffensive and that didn't work. And oh boy, mm-hmm. you know, what do I do? You know, like mm-hmm. one girl said to me, like, why do I, why should I have kids? Like, why would I literally, you know, find a husband and start a family now? Mm-hmm. And the birth rate is plummeting here because mm-hmm. there's people going, yeah, I'm not going to have kids. I'm going to wait it out a bit. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, there's so many social issues. Five million refugees in Europe, most of them women and children. You know, are they coming home? Oh, I, don't know. I don't think so. Uh, yeah. How do you lose five million people? Right. Like, as an economy, I don't I'm not an economist. I'm just going, wow, that scale of that. Oh, but now little Vadim is in the kindergarten here in Amsterdam, and he has friends. It's going to be hard to take him back to Ukraine. Right, well, now right, I have a job, right. and I can support my whole family mm-hmm. in Ukraine with these Danish wages that I get. Mm-hmm. So, wow, it's going to be a massive mm-hmm. one, man. And then the separation, like the husband's still here, and the wife's, I mean, wow. The oh, scale yeah, of the that's f- for, for generations to go, you know? That's for generations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I don't know okay. how, you, how, how one suppresses something of that kind. What do you see... Oh. In the context of Russian future, though, do you would you that country disintegrated? Would you that country to be somehow opposed and controlled? Do you think Ukrainian future depends predominantly on Russian falling apart and, and disintegration? Is there a way to for Ukrainians to survive and for Russia to be as it is right now? I don't. I mean, yeah, probably. I gotta apologize for again stuffing you with all sorts of political questions. It's just, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm aware that we're probably not not that qualified to talk about topics of this kind. But I'm curious about your opinion. I mean, yeah, I, I my first instinct was I don't know, um, mm-hmm. but I know that like the narrative here, you know, among my friends is like, you know, the, what do you call it? Um, breaking Russia up into the bits and pieces like mm-hmm. Dagestan, ha- you know, and all the, you know, and mm-hmm. reducing yeah, it to whatever republics. Russia actually is. The, huh? yeah. yeah. The um, republics, I mean, those republics that they've gathered. Yeah. Right. And 
basically it's a dictatorship dude you know so maybe that should stop and they should become a democracy and don't see that happening after 600 years of totalitarian rule whether it's czars or soviets or putin um that's a big you know um, that's a big step up, at least, you know, in other parts of the world, uh, you, you know, somebody in your family who fought for the revolution against mm -hmm. this or that, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, where Russia has no role models because mm -hmm. nobody's ever had the balls in that country to overturn the t totalitarian uh, regime, whoever they are. Right. So, um, wow. I don't know. Um, they should just fuck off from Ukraine first of all. And then, um, you know, more sanctions, uh, which might not be working. I don't even know how effective they are, but. I mean, the first step is to get, you know, you know, get them out of Ukraine, give Ukraine back the borders that the international community, did, you know, decided upon in 1992. And that, and, uh, that Russia agreed to, Russia itself agreed to, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the first step. I mean, I, I mean, nobody even knows what Russia is, you know. So it's just this weird fucking place who takes over other countries and you know mm -hmm. thinks they own everything. I don't know. With this kind um, of a circus that he was demonstrated this couple of days when the so-called election was taking place, and you know this yeah. whole of a freak show that that took place. That was that was just and sad freak to show, observe. man. That's a good one. It is a freak show. Never any freak show. It's on some cable channel that nobody you know watches, but then all of a sudden we have to watch it because you know people are dying because of the freak show, right? But yeah, first step is just you know victory for Ukraine, kicking Russia out, taking back Crimea, blowing up the Kerch Bridge, taking back all you know whatever, and then uh, then we then we can talk, right? Um, literally, freedom, uh, victory is I think the the goal right now. Um, what happens after that? I literally not qualified um mm -hmm. you know but i just know what yeah, my ukrainian is. friends say right um you know the disintegration of of, of the russia you know, current russia um but then i don't even know how that happens so whatever um this is and one one ukrainians. would imagine a certain guarantees must must be must ensue but then again guarantees can can be broken as we've all observed and seen so uh -huh. yeah now you can't trust those people right but um mm. It's, it's kind of funny with their old oh, our, our historical lands that Putin was banging on about, you know, and, and then our joke in Scandinavia is like, Russia, your country is literally named after our people, right? We call it Rusland. Um, and the Rus was the, the Vikings who, uh, you know, came down the rivers a thousand years ago. And so their country is called the land of the Rus and we are the Rus, right? Um, you know, and yeah, so Vladimir, he's not in the position of talking, right? It's about historical, <laughs> you know, yeah. In every town, every city in Russia that is like Grad or Gorod, you know, Belgorod, that's, that was Vikings who founded that because that's a Danish, uh, Scandinavian word, guard, mm, you know, mm, uh, mm. this is kind of funny. And we came here and set up the Kievan Rus with the, uh, with the Kiev, with the people here, you know, and we, we did, you know, we had a great collaboration with them. So yeah, we should maybe come back. Um, to our <laughs> historical lands, and, you know, that would be great. The to be have their historical lands, you know, in Crimea. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, you know, whatever. That's you know, yeah. a thousand years ago we were here, man. We we're literally, mm -hmm. and in a thousand years ago, Moscow was like eight houses and six yep. goats, yep. right? And yep. Kiev was yep. a massive yep. city, yes. right? Yes. So yes, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> That's true. So besides art, do you find an escape in anything else? Man, bars. Mm. <laughs> yeah, boy. Yeah, not many. Yeah, in the evenings here, you know, mm. going out, a lot of socializing in bars. I'm going to a club in a, uh, as soon as I'm done talking to you. Uh, you know, hanging out there, and um, yeah, okay, that sounds like I'm <laughs> drinking too much, which I probably am. I think probably everybody is at the moment, okay. but yeah. um, no, which like, is forgivable. Yeah, I'm fine with it. Um, uh, I mean. Social, I mean, social interaction, right? This, in my work, I know that, that a healthy neighborhood where you live is one where you have lots of social connections, right? You're on the street, you're waving to people. Um, I live in Pudil, um, and like I, I have a tiny little bubble that I navigate every day, right. really. Um, so yeah, I'm on the street, I'm waving to people, you know, hey, how you doing? How you doing? You know, like uh, that helps me. That's therapy as well, right? If I'm just this sad foreigner with no friends, you know, uh, uh, you know, going into, supermarkets and bars and drinking alone or whatever yeah that's but here i got you know i got a network and the people on the street that i wave to literally therapy to walk around my neighbor it's like i imagine a lot of thing. ukrainians are just simply happy to speak english with someone how do you assess ukrainian english level okay she's got all wild and crazy questions buddy i like it um <laughs> 
It's it's funny, like it, it, you're like the French because the French are saying, "I'm so sorry, I'm uh, for my English," you know, and you guys, "Oh, I'm sorry like, for my English," and then you're literally speaking, you know, they're all speaking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. That's almost perfect, as a meme. Right? As one person says yeah. hello, and the next line is "Sorry for my bad English," right? He hasn't yeah, yeah. even said anything. Yeah. No, it's fine. I mean, uh, most of the people I hang out with, you know, like professionally, the architects and you know whatever artists. I mean, a lot. Of, it's not often that I meet somebody that literally doesn't speak English. I'm in the capital city of a country, you know, so. Um, yeah, when I go out to the, you know, provinces, uh, you know, I, I bring an interpreter with me because out there that's literally, you know, uh, English is not a thing that they use every day. So, um, yeah, it's fine. Um, it's, it's all good. Like you guys, before all this shit happened, you know, yeah, you were looking to Europe and America. So you, you're pivoting towards your, you know, economic development and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you have to speak English if you want to be competitive on the workforce, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Cameras off. Sure. Yeah, not to stretch your time for too long. Who, I like bringing that question to my guests, who is the most interesting person you've ever run into? Huh. Okay, you can edit out this long thinking break here. <laughs> um, wow. Wow. Pop. Oh, it's Somebody who's What's perhaps... What does that mean? Somebody who okay, let me let me par paraphrase that. Somebody who's had the the most impact on you, perhaps who you personally met or otherwise, unnecessarily who anybody stands out. Ah, I mean, I got to go with my mama, really. Yeah, great, um, yeah. matriarch, total matriarch, like a mafia boss yeah, running the family. Yeah, you know, with uh, yeah. she like when you know when she passed and was on her deathbed, everybody came in the family from all over the world. You know, it was amazing, mm -hmm. um, big influence. But um, I don't know. Um, I'm really like, I, yeah, I like that answer though. You know, it's like, like it's no, not necessarily to come up with some sort yeah. of a public figure, right? No, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I've met lots of public figures, you know, geez. Yeah. Um, um, but you know, meeting that famous person. Oh, wow. Yeah. I met them. Yeah. Hi, I love your work. Yeah. I don't like that. Yeah. I think the most interesting people person is like whoever I'm going to meet tonight, you know, right. uh, right. if the conversation is good and it's dynamic and, and, uh, you know, it's, it could be, and it'll be somebody different tomorrow. It's like, yeah. whoever's in front of me right now is interesting. Yeah. Somebody that I can learn from that I can joke with that we have right. a dream, you know, whatever it's, that's, yeah. right. you know, right. it's whoever, whoever's in front of me at any given moment that I like. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's almost a philosophy in a way, right? Everybody can bring something, can contribute somehow. Uh, yeah. Like what the fuck, um, man? Like, if I met Obama, you know, who follows me on Twitter, that's kind of funny. Right. But, yeah. um, if I met him, yeah, wow. I mean, it would only be interesting if I sat down with him for an hour, one-to-one, yeah. -one yeah. and had a conversation. Yeah. And he could say, so what do you do, Michael? And I could say, well, I don't know. What, what, what was it? You know, I, and we had a conversation. Like meeting some fucking celebrity on the street means nothing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a selfie. So it has to have yeah. some sort of depth. So a long conversation with a new person at a bar or a friend at a bar, um, you know, whatever, that's, that's more, that's more. Well, yeah. Valuable. In fact, plenty of people claim that you should never meet your sort of idol or paragon or role model because then you just lose one. Yeah. yeah. Basically. Yeah. You kind of like, yeah. But I always say the, I, I have another podcast about 100 things I'll miss when I'm dead. So it was a COVID mm -hmm. project. So I stopped thinking about my mortality every day. And I said, what am I going to miss when I'm dead? How do I swing, you know, swing this in a positive way? But one of them is uh, Søren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, the father of existentialism. I, mm. I know everything about this guy. And um, I, I just wish I could drink with him. I just wish mm. I could sit at a bar mm. with him, you know, but he's, yeah. he's dead in 19, 19, 1850, right? But it's kind of like I kind of judge people by what I want to drink with them. If I'm choosing politicians to vote for in Denmark, I'm going to go, okay, she says a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think I could drink with her. But her, <laughs> I could. I, I get a vibe that if she walked into the bar and sat down, there would be. A, it would be great to drink with. I, I, that's kind of my uh, my uh, how I judge people is what I yeah, would yeah, they be yeah. fun to drink with, right? So the criteria, right? Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. That's great. And yeah, those. Are you into reading? What? Are you into reading? Are you? Uh, yeah. Reading. Oh my God. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like 50 yeah. books a year. I mean, yeah. Wow. That's impressive. Oh, yeah. That's great. Oh yeah. Any, so I know I, I am compromising my guests by asking some sorts of questions of that level of primitivity, but again, like what's, what's the recommendation? Any, anything that springs to mind that could be recommended you would wish everyone to read. Hmm. Okay. Fuck. Um, 
Yeah. So I know it's a it's a tough one. I've I've been asked that one, and I take the same pauses. And but it's like it's one of it's very indicative of a person I find, and it's a great representation, I guess. Well, if you're in Ukraine, you should read my book that I just published, 45 mm. Urban Ideas for Ukraine, about how to make cities better. So um, okay. that's uh, why yeah, I published sure. it to inspire Ukrainians. Yeah. But uh, that's only in Ukrainian. But I'm going, I, I, I read, I read like, you know, literature more than anything else. Um, yeah. So I think, okay, wait, there's a book on my table behind me. Uh, hang on okay. a sec. Um, oh, the camera's off again, for fuck's sake. But it's called yeah, Russian I, Colonial. I didn't, have balls, I didn't have balls to, to point the attention to it one more time. I'm like... I think I've already yeah. abused it. There's a book I have given on my birthday uh, last month, uh, Russian Colonialism 101, an illustrated mm. guide by Maxim uh, Eristavi. So that mm. just gives you the rundown about how, you know, how Russia has just been bullshitting and, right, you know, right. Rus Russifying and for, yeah. you know, since when does the book start? Yeah, 19, yeah. 1900s. Yeah. Um, right. yeah. So that's my recommendation right now, understanding in great detail the complex, uh, uh, nature of this uh, of, of of this invasion and understanding right. what Ukraine is uh, instead of all the narrative that you get on the right, right wing channels about you know so yeah that's the recommendation Russian colonialism one hundred and one in English is the book beautiful beautiful and on that I will have to call it a day I am beyond beyond words grateful that you've agreed to um, a sudden and not much promising offer from myself. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for doing that. Oh, I that. appreciate it. It's usually all urbanism questions and shit about my work, right? So this is mm -hmm. like total freestyle. I liked it. It was good. Yeah, absolutely. Totally unscripted as I, as I wanted. It might have been a little bit more professional from my side, but you know, I, I think, yeah, yeah. That... It's a conversation. So you're the most yeah, interesting absolutely. person in my life right now because you're in yeah. front of me and have a good chat. So there you go. It'll change. I'll meet somebody else in a while. So don't yeah, I hope it will change. You know, right if, I, if, I, if I keep having that title, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you will <laughs> run into somebody more more interesting yeah. um yes so thank cool. you a lot and